Okay, so, so we are now in chapter 10, the chapter on the planes of realization. And last week we finished the first part of this chapter. This is the chapter that deals with the stages of realization synoptically, taking them all together. And there were two major schemes that we came across in this part of the book. The first scheme is we call the major scheme in the Buddha's teaching. This is of four main planes of realization. The planes or stages of stream entry, once returning, non-returning, and arahatship. Each one being subdivided into two secondary planes the stage of the path and the stage of the fruit. And so this re- uh, gives altogether eight, well, these eight noble persons, eight Aryans. And then in addition to this, there's a secondary scheme, which is that of the seven types of noble persons. Here we have the Arahat divided into two types depending on whether they are liberated in both ways or liberated by wisdom. Then we have three intermediate stages, those who have reached at least the stage of stream entry up to the stage of being on the path to our hardship. This is the one who is the body witness, the one who achieves the formless meditation, the one attained to view, one who has strong wisdom but not the formless meditation, the one liberated by faith or resolved through faith, the one whose strong faculty is faith without the formless liberation. And then we have two types of persons who are on the way to stream entry. This is the Dharma follower, the one whose strong faculty is wisdom, investigating the Dhamma, and the one who is called the faith follower. This is the disciple who has the strong faith faculty and who develops the stages of practice through motivated by faith, through his love and devotion for the Buddha. Okay, so this is what was covered in the first section of this chapter. Now we come to the remaining sections which are going to provide a closer focus on each of these stages individually. I already took one section within this, or let's say one passage within this section in order to provide a closer, a finer analysis of the difference between the Dhamma follower and the faith follower. And so I'll just treat that section in a very summary way. But we start here at the beginning, the section on stream entry on page 392. Here we have four factors 
leading to stream entry. So these would be four factors that one has to cultivate, actually even before one can enter the fixed course of rightness, that is, even before one can attain the path to stream entry. Okay, so here the Buddha is speaking to Sariputta, and he says, Sariputta, it is said, and here the Pali expression is Sota Pati Yanga. I will write that. The word sotapati means, is what we translate as stream entry. The word sota means stream. And apati in this case means entering into, attaining. Maybe since it's a stream, we could also even speak about falling into the stream. And then anga, the word anga is factor component. And what is that why doing there? <laughs> okay, I'm just testing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just what they call a euphonic, in this case it's a semi-vowel, just for joining the I and the A. Okay, the reason why I wrote this word on the board, we will also come across the same expression as a designation for the factors of the stream entera. And so there's a difference in the way we break down the compound. We could understand it either as a factor for stream entry or as a factor of stream entry. In this passage here, it's being, it should be understood in the former sense a factor for stream entry, a factors, the factors that are necessary for attaining stream entry. Okay, so the Buddha asks Venerable Sariputta, he says, it is said a factor for stream entry is actually sotapati yangani, the factors, stream entry factors. So then he says, what Sariputta is a factor for stream entry. Now Sariputta is going to mention four factors. These are encountered fairly often in the text. They don't originate from Sariputta, but the Buddha himself has taught them on numerous occasions. So here we have association with superior persons, so with good persons. Sapurisa Sevana. I think it's Sapurisa Sanseva. Hearing the true Dhamma or the good Dhamma. Careful attention and practice in accordance with the Dhamma is a factor for stream entry. So here we have four factors. And if we look at them, we can see something interesting, distinguishing the first two from the second two. Can anybody pick up what is the distinguishing factor between the first two and the second two? You're very close. In a way, they're all conditions, but there's, you, you pretty much hit the distinction, but if you just phrase it a little differently, it will be exactly. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, the first two depend, in the first two, one is relying on an external source of contact or information, and the second two are things that one practices within oneself. 
cultivates within oneself. So first, and the Buddha is set these out in a distinct sequence. First, one has to associate with good persons, superior persons. In the Buddha's time, it would be associating with the Buddha himself, or the great disciples, those who are well-grounded in the Dhamma. Often the word superior person is used pretty much as a synonym for Aryan persons, noble ones. But one might not have the ability to judge who is a noble one, who isn't, but still one could judge in a general way who is a good person, a superior person, by observing the person's conduct, investigating the person's knowledge, um, observing the way the person interacts with others. So on this basis, one can come to some conclusion who is worthy to associate with. And so first, one has to come into association with superior persons or good persons. These are superior persons with regard to the Dhamma, those who seem to be well-grounded in both knowledge and practice of the Dhamma, and therefore seem to be reliable sources of instruction in the Dhamma. Association with superior persons will correspond very closely to another term or expression that is often advocated by the Buddha. What is that expression? Either in English, some of you will probably even know the Pali, What is it? It's, yeah, say it more loudly. Kalyanamita. <laughs> that means a good friend, a wise friend, noble friendship. And so there's a sutra in, in fact it comes in the Maka Sanyuta, Sanyuta Nikaya, where it's Ananda comes to the Buddha and says to the Buddha, he's been reflecting, and he says, in my opinion, good friendship is half of the spiritual life, the Brahmacharya. Then the Buddha says, do not say so, Ananda. Do not say so, Ananda. Good friendship is not half the spiritual life, but it is the entire spiritual life. Because it's depending upon a good friend that one learns the Dhamma and learns to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay, so first one has to find who are the good people and then associate with them. So that is the first factor, an external factor. So even if that person is not very talkative, even if they're not very knowledgeable in the theory of the Dhamma, but still they can provide inspiring examples and they can give personal advice from time to time. But still, in order to really make further progress along the way to stream entry, one has to hear the Dhamma. So that is the second factor. And the Buddha mentions, in fact, in some sutras, that there are two conditions for the arising of right view, in the sense of penetrative wisdom. Okay, one of these conditions is the voice of another. Parato Gosa. So the voice of another is said to be one of the conditions for right view because one has to hear the Dhamma from somebody else. It's said the exceptions to this are those bodhisattvas who will become, in their last life, become Buddhas and those who will become Pacheka Buddhas. They don't depend on learning the Dhamma from others. But everybody else has to, in order to reach stream entry, 
have to hear the true Dhamma or the good Dhamma from somebody who's teaching it. Okay, once one hears the true Dhamma, then one has to go further and now one has to develop internally. And that comes first through what is called Yoniso Manasitara. So when one hears, after one has heard the Dhamma, then one bears it in mind, at least one remembers the main principles that have been taught, and then one has to reflect on the teaching that one has learned, examining it, applying it to one's own experience, investigating one's own experience in the light of the Dhamma, and so this is all part of the process of what is called Yoniso Manasitara. This word Yoniso, it's very difficult to find one English word that represents it adequately. Yoni sometimes means the womb. And so this is in so, the ending so gives a sense of moving outward. So it's something like going from the womb, in other words, from the depths of something, moving out. Or maybe we could even understand it as investigating something down to the root level, the fun most fundamental level. Or it can also be understood to mean investigating things thoroughly, in detail, or investigating, examining things precisely, accurately, correctly. So all of these are some of the implications of this word yoniso. And then manasikara is more than simple attention, but it's consideration, examination. It's an intellectual process, but it's a process that has to be guided by a spiritual aim. It's not just learning the Dhamma conceptually and intellectually, but it has to be applied personally to one's own life, to one's own experience. And then this leads naturally into the fourth factor of stream entry. This is called practice in accordance with the Dhamma. And so at this stage, one takes up the threefold training in morality, samadhi, meditation, and vipassana, insight, wisdom, in order to develop panya, wisdom. And so practice in accordance with the Dhamma is explained, usually it's emphasizing the aspect of wisdom, of investigating things in terms of impermanence, suffering, non-self, in order to develop insight. Okay, so these are the four factors for stream entry. And then this dialogue continues, and the Buddha asks Sariputta, what is the stream? When we speak about stream entry, what is the stream? And Sariputta says, it's the Noble Eightfold Path, that is, from right view to right concentration. And then the Buddha confirms, this is the stream. And then he asks, a stream enterer, a stream enterer, what now is a stream enterer? And then Sariputta says, one who possesses the Noble Eightfold Path, he is called the stream enterer. Okay, so this indicates what is the distinctive factor, or what is the, the distinctive quality of the stream enterer is that he is one who possesses the Noble Eightfold Path. Like, while we're still not yet even a stream enterer, but still practicing along the way to stream entry, what we practice is the Noble Eightfold Path, 
but we don't yet possess the path. But what happens with the stream enterer, when that breakthrough occurs, the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path become, we can use the expression, they become integrated into his very being, into his, the very substance of his mind, so that he always potentially has access to the Noble Eightfold Path. By practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, he's come to that experience of breaking through to stream entry. And with that breakthrough experience, he acquires the definite right view, he acquires right intention, his speech, action, livelihood naturally become purified, he can easily arouse right effort and right mindfulness, and he gains access immediate access to right concentration. And so he now comes into possession of this Noble Eightfold Path, which is now a permanent part of his being, something that he can never lose. But what he has to do is to continue to cultivate the factors of that Noble Eightfold Path in order to reach the higher stages. Okay, but now we have a person who is equipped with the four factors of stream entry, who is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, and then as that person goes on practicing, at a certain point they enter the sixth course of rightness. This means that this person becomes either a faith follower or a Dhamma follower. And that is what's explained in passage 2 here. This I discussed last week, so we won't go through this again. But we see, just to recapitulate briefly, that after one becomes a, either a Dhamma follower or a faith follower, one is bound to reach the fruit of stream entry in that very same life itself. And what makes the breakthrough, or what marks the breakthrough to the stage of stream entry is indicated in the last paragraph of this section. One who knows and sees these teachings thus, these dhammas, these principles, is called a stream enterer who is no longer bound to the lower world, that is, he can never again be reborn in any of the three planes of misery, the hell, the animal realm, the realm of the afflicted spirit. He's fixed in destiny, that is, he has to move on definitely to the attainment of liberation, and he has enlightenment, full enlightenment, some bodhi, as his destination. And so this knowing and seeing these things as they really are, that marks what we call Dhamma Bhisamaya, the breakthrough to the Dhamma, or gaining the eye of Dhamma. Then in the third passage here, this is on page 394, the Buddha uses a simile to illustrate the benefits of making this breakthrough. So on one occasion, he takes a little bit of soil in his fingernail, picks it up from the ground in his fingernail, and he asks the monk, what do you think is more, this little bit of soil that I've taken up in my fingernail, or this greater? And so naturally the monks say that the great earth is much greater than that little bit of soil in your fingernail, a little bit of, finger, of soil in the fingernail doesn't amount to a hundredth part or a thousandth part or a hundred thousandth part of the greater. Okay, so then the Buddha brings out the point. He says, for a noble disciple, a person accomplished in view who has made the breakthrough, the suffering that has been destroyed and eliminated is more 
Well, that, re- what, that which remains is just a little bit, it's trifling. The little bit of suffering that remains, it does not amount to a hundredth part, or a thousandth part, or a hundred thousandth part of the former mass of suffering that has been destroyed and eliminated. For that most, for the stream enterer, there are seven more lives. After seven more lives, he makes the complete end of dukkha, of suffering. And so he says, of such great benefit is the breakthrough to the Dhamma. Of such great benefit is it to obtain the vision of the Dhamma. This is the eye of the Dhamma. Okay, this sutra is just the first of a whole chapter with about 12, I think there are 12 suttas. In each of these, the Buddha uses a different simile to illustrate the same point, the amount of suffering that the stream enterer has eliminated and just a little bit of suffering that remains in seven more lives. Okay, now in paragraph, in passage four, we come to the four factors of a stream enterer. The Pali expression is the same, it's Sota Pati Yanga, but it's used with a different meaning. Here it's not the factors that make for the attainment of stream entry, but it's the four factors that make one a stream enterer. So what are these four factors? Okay, here a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence, or you might also translate this, unwavering confidence in the Buddha. Here the Pali expression. The Pali expression here is Abhecha Pasada. And this word Abhecha comes from the verb Abhechi, which I'm not sure whether it ever occurs as a simple verb, but it has the meaning of to undergo, in other words, to experience. And so Abhecha Pasada is confidence or trust that is based upon experience based upon having gained realization, having gained insight, direct insight into the truth. But the commentaries explain Abhita to mean unshakable or unwavering. So this is the trust or confidence that can never be shaken, that can never waver, because it's based on direct personal insight into the truth of the Dhamma. Okay, so the first of these is confirmed confidence or unwavering confidence, unwavering trust in the Buddha. And then it uses the standard formula for the Buddha that he's an arahant, perfectly enlightened, one who's awakened to all of the principles of the spiritual life. He's accomplished in true knowledge or higher knowledge and proper conduct. He's Sugata, one who has reached the good destination, who's attained Nirvana. He's a knower of the world, one who understands all of the constituents and principles of the world. He's the unsurpassed leader or trainer of persons to be tamed. He's the teacher of devas and human beings. He is Buddha, the enlightened one, who also enlightens others. And he is Bhagava, the blessed one, the one who possesses all these worthy qualities. Okay, then he has confirmed confidence in the Dhamma. 
Say he has confirmed confidence in the Buddha because actually what he's seen and penetrated is the truth of the Dhamma. And so based on that experience, he has the trust in the Buddha because he know, he's learned this teaching from the Buddha or from a lineage that comes down from the Buddha. And so he has trust in the Buddha as being the per- proper, correct, accurate teacher. But it's the Dhamma that he has penetrated through direct experience. And so he has this confirmed confidence in the Dhamma that this Dhamma is well expounded by the Blessed One. And that phrase, this refers to the Dhamma as the teaching. The Dhamma as the verbal teaching. The teaching expounded in doctrines, principles, found and recorded in suttas. But the rest of this formula refers to the experiential Dhamma. Dhamma in the sense of the truth. Here the Dhamma is directly visible. It's something that one can see for oneself. It's something immediate. The Pali word akaliko actually means not involving time. But the implication is that one could see it in this very life itself. It's not something that one does acts of merit in the hope of seeing <laughs> in a future life. Then it's called Ehi Pasiko, which means literally come and see. So it's a teaching that is open to investigation and to verification. It invites examination. And then it's Opanayako, which I understand to mean that it's worthy of being applied to oneself. Some translate this as leading onward. In fact, the commentary also supports that interpretation. Leading onward step by step to Nibbana. Okay, and then the last phrase is to be personally experienced by the wise. Pachatang Veti Tabo Vinyuhi. Again, this, all of these expressions are in one way or another emphasizing that the Dhamma is something to be personally experienced. And so in a way this last expression just sums up what the earlier ones are saying. And so this noble disciple who becomes the stream enterer, he himself has personally experienced the Dhamma. And so he knows that it is to be personally experienced by the wise. And then in the third, as the third factor, he has confirmed confidence in the Sangha. And this is not the Sangha as the monastic order, but the Sangha of noble disciples. The Sangha, the spiritual community, of those who have achieved penetration of the truth of the Dhamma. And so he has confidence that the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is practicing the good way, practicing the straight way, practicing the true way, practicing the proper way. And then who is that noble Sangha, that Sangha of the Buddha's disciples? It's the, fa- the four pairs of persons, the eight types of individuals. That is, the stream enterer, once returner, non returner, arahant, and those on the path to those stages. Okay, so this Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality. I think I re- <laughs> mentioned this when I was in Sri Lanka, I saw somebody maybe it was a Sri Lankan person <laughs> translated this <laughs> worthy of hospitalization. <laughs> hospitality has a different meaning. <laughs> maybe both words probably come from the same origin, a place where one is treated well. <laughs> 
is worthy of hospitality, <coughs> worthy of offering, and worthy of angali. Angali means a, a gesture of salutation, of putting the two hands together. Japanese call it gasho. And then the unsurpassed field of merit for the world. <clears throat> okay, and then the, so these three factors of the Sri Mantra we could say are expressions of the Sri Mantra's faith or sadha, but this is a faith which is grounded in insight or wisdom because it's confirmed confidence. Faith based upon personal insight, personal experience, personal realization. But the fourth factor of stream entry is concerned with the conduct of the noble disciple, that is, with his sila or moral virtue. And so it says of the noble disciple that he possesses the moral virtue, I'm sorry, he possesses the moral virtues dear to the noble ones, or loved by the noble ones, unbroken, untorn, unblemished, unmodeled, freeing, their liberating virtues, praised by the wise, then this next word is important, they are not grasped. And this is the same word that we come across in one of these uh, fetters that is abandoned by the stream enterer. Sila Bhatta Paramasa, which means wrong grasp of sila or rules and bhatta observances. And so the stream enterer possesses these virtues but doesn't grasp them in the sense of misunderstanding them but undertaking them in a superstitious way. And then the benefit of these virtues is that they lead to samadhi, that is, to deep meditation, deep concentration. Now sometimes the question is raised, is it possible for a stream enterer to consciously break the five precepts. And so sometimes some people understand that when the stream enterer becomes possessed of these virtues, dear to the noble ones, they are incapable of breaking the five precepts. Whether this is so is something I don't know, but it's not stated explicitly in the suttas, at least to my knowledge, that it's impossible for a stream enterer to break any of the five precepts. There are certain things that it is said to be impossible for a stream enterer to do. In fact, six things that are said to be impossible for such a person to do. One is to take the, the life of his father, to take the life of his mother, to take the life of an arahant, to maliciously wound the Buddha. It's said that the Buddhas always live their full natural lifespan, so they cannot be killed. But it is possible for somebody with a mind of hatred to wound the Buddha. In Buddha's coat in his own life, his envious and malicious cousin named Devadatta wanted to take control of the Sangha, he wanted to be the head of the Sangha, to be the world-famous teacher. And so he thought the big obstacle to his advancing his career was the presence of the Buddha himself. And so Devadatta plotted and schemed to take the Buddha's life in various ways. When all attempts, all of his attempts at plots and schemes fell, then Devadatta himself, one day when the Buddha was dwelling on the ledge of a cliff, Devadatta climbed up 
to a higher point of that cliff and then took a boulder and pushed the boulder down so that as it went rolling down it would hit the Buddha and in his hope kill the Buddha. But as the boulder was rolling down it hit another rock and veered off in a different direction. But when it hit that other rock then a splint of the boulder broke off and flew towards the Buddha and hit him in the leg and wounded him so that he was bleeding. And in this way, Devadatta had committed this one of these deadly crimes. Because in the fourth thing that a free mentor can do is with a mind of hatred and anger to wound the Buddha. Perhaps if somebody is saving the Buddha, they might, <laughs> the razor is not sharp, it might commit the skin, but that would not be done maliciously. So it wouldn't count as <laughs> an offense of this type. Okay, and then the fifth, the fifth is with a mind of ill will to try to break, or to actually break, to divide a Sangha, a, a community, a monastic community, which is living in harmony. So it can, somebody with a malicious mind might spread rumors about one group to members of another group, and in this way they try to create a division in the harmonious Sangha. And then the sixth thing that the stream enterer cannot do and that is to look up that anybody apart from the Buddha himself as being a fully enlightened teacher. So stream enterer can approve of aspects of the teachings of other spiritual, spiritual teachers, but the one that they regard as the fully enlightened Buddha is the one that we know historically as the Buddha. Okay, so these are six things which the texts say in a number of places it's impossible for a stream enterer to do. But some other things that it's impossible for them to do is to look at any conditioned phenomena as permanent, to look at any conditioned phenomena as a source of bliss or happiness, and to take anything to be a true, truly existing self. But I've never seen a statement that says it's impossible for the stream enterer to break the five precepts. But my supposition is, this is my own understanding, that while he's alive after reaching stream enter entry, a stream enterer will not break the five precepts out of respect for the Buddha, out of respect for the Dhamma, out of respect for the training. He'll observe the five precepts very carefully. Interesting case is that of Paul speech. Okay, what if the stream enterer, they can be a married person with children, if they want to dissuade the child from doing something bad, can they tell them the little white lie? If you do this, the dragon will come and eat you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, probably not if they want the child to grow up to speak the truth and so they'll always train them by speaking the truth but what strikes me maybe the reason why such a strict rule is not laid down that the stream enterer can't break the five precepts because the stream enterer can come back as a human being and maybe as a little child they'll still have certain mischievous tendencies which have not yet been completely overcome. And so maybe as a little child they might tell little lies, maybe they'll kill an insect from time to time. But once the child, this is my supposition, but once the child comes to the age of reason and maybe learn something about the Dhamma, then once they learn the five precepts they'll take immediately, they'll take to them immediately and then they will observe them carefully. This is my supposition, I might be wrong about this. 
I mean, it might be the case that they actually always observe the five precepts, even as a little child. Okay, so, summing up, the Buddha just repeats the same thing. One who possesses these four things is a stream enterer, no longer bound to the lower world, fixed in destiny with enlightenment as his destination. Then, the next passage, the Buddha wants to show the benefit of possessing these factors of stream entry. So he takes the case first of the wheel-turning monarch. This is the universal monarch, one who rules over the whole world. So he exercises sovereignty over the four continents. And then, with the breakup of the body, he is reborn in a heavenly world, in the company of the devas of the Tabatings of realm. And there he is accompanied by a, a retinue of celestial nymphs and he enjoys himself with the five objects of heavenly sensual pleasures. But still, the Buddha says, as he doesn't possess four things, he is not yet freed from hell, the animal realm, the realm of the afflicted spirits. He's not freed from the plains of misery, the bad destinations, the lower world. Okay, but even though a noble disciple is maintaining himself by going on arms round and wearing red robes, still, if he possesses these four things, he's freed from the possibility of rebirth in the lower realms, the bad destinations, and so on. So what are those four things? These four factors of stream entry. And then the Buddha says, between obtaining sovereignty over the four continents and obtaining these four things, the obtaining of sovereignty over the four continents is not worth a sixteenth part, not even a very small fraction, of obtaining those four things, the four factors of stream entry. Okay, maybe at this point, then, I'll ask whether there's any questions. Or comments? Um, this is a very small point, but I'll bring in to this repetition of in some of the reasons for it. The effect of the stream entry, the effect of the stream entry. Oh, I and see. Yeah. It just seems that this is a stylistic feature. I think we come across this not only in this passage, but whenever somebody comes to ask about a particular term, they always repeat it. <laughs> I don't know why. It may be, it's not a. Re- the original part of the conversation, perhaps it's just a literary device to call, give special emphasis to that term. That's all I can think of. Okay. Um, two questions. One is that when it comes to lying, is it a fact that we're still being involved in that, but sometimes it's necessary not to say something um, I think it definitely intention will, let's say, color the nature of a lie so that um, if there's a, if an intention to protect somebody from some embarrass, embarrassment, it's quite different from lying to secure some special advantage for oneself or for, for the purpose of harming somebody else. It's a question of whether, say, somebody who is observing the five precepts, they take the precepts, Musabhada, Veryamani, Sikapadam, Samadhi, Ami. I take the precepts to abstain, to abstain from false speech. Okay, so what is false speech? Let's say I'm feeling really bad on a particular day. Somebody says to me, how are you today? You know, I don't want to burden this, pro- this person with my problems. So I say, all right. Fine, thank you, how are you? 
I wouldn't consider that Musabada a lie. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No, no. It's just engaging in polite conforming to the standards of polite conversation. Um, let, wait, but let us say, let us take a more difficult situation. Okay, this is always the standard one used for a case like this. We're in Nazi Germany at the time Hitler is coming to power. They are capturing Jewish people and bringing them to concentration camps. One has some Jewish neighbors or friends and they come to the house and say, can you help me? So one takes them. Maybe one has already built an extra room in the basement or an extra room in the attic and so they're living in the attic or the basement. Then the SS officers come to the house and say, have you seen any Jewish people? In a situation like that, I think the demand of compassion says that <laughs> one has to say no or find out that, or find some way to express oneself so that one doesn't betray those people who have committed themselves to one's trust. Okay, please, yeah. Um, one is not allowed to see an animal to one's own purposes, but if one is eating meat, yeah. is that transgression? No, no. <coughs> the Buddha says, in fact, this is a common misunderstanding of Buddhism that it requires vegetarianism, but it doesn't. What the Buddhist texts say, and this is the Buddha laying down a regulation for monastics, is that the monastic is not allowed to eat meat under three conditions, that he's seen the animal killed specifically for him, that he hears that the animal has been killed for him. Somebody tells him that, or he hears maybe the screams of an animal that's being slaughtered, or he has some reasonable ground for suspecting that an animal has been killed for him. But apart from those conditions, the Buddha says that it's not blameworthy to eat meat. In fact, many uh, Buddhists do become vegetarians because they don't like the idea of eating meat. But it's not made compulsory, except within, <laughs> within Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, Korean, Monasticism is compulsory. And finally, I mean, um, the word that's used for the Buddha in Sagada is that's gone. Yeah. So, I'm asking this because I think that I have much more of an understanding of the Dharma, and I think that I look at you uh, in terms of my modern, my inspiration, but relating to the Buddha is very accessible. Yeah, yeah. I would expect the history, yeah. but first of all, I mean, not that I mean the English, but it's very accessible. Yeah, yeah. And I really don't know what to do about it. <laughs> because of the, you know, you know what I mean? I, I know that, I could understand that. But I think if you read accounts of the Buddha's life, then it brings the Buddha more to, to life, he makes it more alive. I guess it's somewhat abstract because it goes back 2,500 years. But if one do, does this, what I call the Buddha, or it's called the Buddha Nusati, the recollection of the Buddha meditation, that is going through these nine qualities of the Buddha, and then co first coming to understand them by studying their meaning, one gets some explanation of them in Bhisuddhi Magga, chapter 7, the path of purification. Then one does the meditation on them. It helps to bring the character of the Buddha to life. And then also reading the life of the Buddha is very helpful. Especially I recommend a book by Venable Yanamoli. It's called simply The Life of the Buddha According to the Pali Canon. So it takes many texts from the Pali Canon. Which, um, and then he tries to sew them together so that they form something of a continuous narrative 
Because in the Pali Canon itself, we don't have a continuous narrative of the Buddha's life. Okay. Yeah. I take this whole expression, Dhamma no Dhamma, just together to mean in accordance with the Dhamma. Anu usually gives the sense as a prefix of in accord with. But when you have Dhamma no Dhamma, it just gives the sense of in accordance with the Dhamma. In other words, one practices, the way I would understand practicing in accordance with the Dhamma, one practices the Dhamma in accordance with the way it's been taught. So one bases oneself on the teachings in order to undertake the practice. Mm -hmm. I would say that he would be able to go into some stage of samadhi based on his previous practice and because he's reached this breakthrough experience he will just, this is the way I would understand it, that he could fail, concentrate his mind fairly easily but even a stream enterer, the way I understand it from the text and I did actually a paper on this topic doesn't necessarily possess the jhanas is not necessarily a jhana attainer. As I studied a number of sutras, and I found like people like Anatta Pindika or the uh, Vitaka, the laywoman Vitaka, they're very much concerned with secular life. And Atapindika with his wealth, his large family, Kisaka also is wealthy with large family, many children and grandchildren. And yet they're stream enterers, but one doesn't see them described in a way which suggests that they are attainers of the jhanas. And I don't see in standard descriptions of the stream enterer in the text that the jhanas are regularly ascribed to them. But certainly they will have some ability to focus the mind, to bring the mind together into a peaceful, quiet and state because of their attainment of stream entry. So are you thinking that before they reach the, the breath of the day, they don't have the time effect? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. And even immediately, even after becoming stream enterers, the way I see it, they don't necessarily have the jhana. The way I see it, the jhana becomes an important factor in the path in making the transition from the stage of once returner to the stage of non returner. <laughs> it seems, it seems to be the case. Even though when we have in the sutras the definition, what is right concentration? The standard definition is first, second, third, fourth jhana. But I think this is just bringing in a formula to define a particular factor. It seems to me that the stream enter will have the ability to focus and collect the mind into some kind of state of samadhi, but that samadhi is not yet at the level of the not necessarily at the level of the first jhana. It's possible to be uh, the ascetic concentration? It's, yeah, access concentration is an expression that is used in the later literature, in the commentaries. But I would say that what they probably have is a kind of samadhi that what we would call access concentration. Uh, 
Well, it seems to be referring definitely to a monastic sangha. Whether that has to be considered the sangha consisting of noble ones, this I don't know for sure, actually. <laughs> because, in, you see, in the Buddhist time, the sangha that was existing was, you can call it, it's a noble sangha. The monastic sangha included many who were noble ones. And so when somebody tries, there are occasions when some monks try to split that sangha to create divisions in the sangha. And so that would have been a case of them committing this fifth, what's called the fifth terrible, terrible deed. Yeah. Wait, I didn't catch the last one. Those are called faculties. Yeah. No, I know the of course they have developed the seven factors of enlightenment, yeah. Yeah. They go together the seven factors of enlightenment, noble eightfold path. It's just a matter of which particular scheme one wants to use. Okay, okay, good question. The Sri Mantra would say possesses the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, but they haven't yet fulfilled the Noble Eightfold Path. They still have to practice, develop the path further to the point where all of the factors come to fulfillment. I just had a question uh, about the question that you were answering before about life of Buddha being the since the 2009 month or two. Just a comment. There's one more book that I came across and I'm reading it. It's a very good by Krishna Khan, Old Path by the Cloud. That's one of the messages. It's also has to be that story. Yeah, but I have to give a little warning about white. What is the old path, white flowers? Yes. Yeah. This is not in any way a personal uh, criticism of Thich Nhat Hanh, but some incidents in the book are, let us say, creations, uh, creative, of course creative creations is redundant, creations or creative in, in, insertions of Thich Nhat Hanh. Is that so? I thought so. I yeah. It's something that I have never ever heard of. Yeah, like I remember, I read it a long time ago. After his enlightenment, his first discourse, it's not to the five ascetics in the deer park, but it's to a group of children yes. who yes. provided him with food when he was meditating under the Bodhi tree. But an explanation of how to mindfully eat an orange, the yes. cantering. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, and then I remember a few other incidents. I mean, they're not historical, so one has to be a little bit... One could read the book for interest and enjoyment, but one has to be a little bit wary about taking everything in the book to be derived from historical sources. Okay, let me take some of these questions from the internet. Okay, what is the difference between Careful attention, Yoni Sikara, and bare attention. Is there any value of practicing bare attention at all? First, bare attention is 
not the term taken from the Pali Canon, but it's a term which was coined in recent times. It was actually coined, I think, by Venerable Nyanapunika to indicate some aspect of the way mindfulness is practiced. So when one is practicing mindfulness, particularly within the Burmese system of insight meditation, one just attends to whatever arises without trying to either grasp onto anything or push it away, but just noting what is occurring. So that is what is meant by bare attention. Whereas what's meant by Yoniso Manasikara is not really so much attention. I think attention is a little misleading, but it's consideration. And it's consideration that uses thought and reflection in order to, after one hears the Dhamma, one has to reflect on the Dhamma, consider it, and investigate one's own life and experience in the light of the Dhamma. And so that is what is meant by, what I understand to be what is meant by Yoniso Manasikara, careful or proper attention. Okay, question two. What is the more essential definition of a stream enterer from a practical perspective? Breaking the first three fetters or attaining unwavering confidence? The practical perspective. Let us say that breaking the first three factors, uh, breaking the first three fetters, this is what occurs with the attainment of stream entry. So when somebody reaches that breakthrough to the Dhamma, it cuts off the first three fetters, so that they're permanently removed. Now, unwavering confidence or unwavering trust, those are the qualities of a stream enterer. What's interesting about both of them is that one can easily be, not so easily, but one can deceive oneself about both of them. So that is why there can be a lot of uncertainty about exactly who is a stream enterer and who isn't. Because the first three fetters, okay, what are they? A view of self, doubt, and freedom from the wrong grasp, or the third that is is the wrong grasp of rules and observances. So if somebody has a good intellectual understanding of the Dhamma, they don't adopt the view of self, because they might have a strong confidence in the Buddha and the teaching. They don't have doubt, and they don't have this attitude of grasping rules and observances. And so they think, Therefore, I am a stream mentor. But in fact, they can have these three attitudes without actually having cut off those fetters. So that's why one could easily deceive oneself about them. And similarly, with the four factors of the stream mentor, somebody can have strong devotional feelings towards the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha. And so they think, this is my unwavering faith and they might be very upright in their conduct, and they think, this is my pure observance of the sealers of the precepts. And so this is why, if somebody thinks that they have stream entry, it's good to go to somebody who is an accomplished meditation master and discuss one's practice and one's experience with them to see whether it can be confirmed or not. Okay, now the third question. Actually, I think I've already answered that just now. Does the stream enterer, always, the stream enterers always know for themselves without delusion that they have entered the stream, or do they have to get confirmation from a teacher? Okay, I think a stream enterer can have a fair degree of certainty that they've entered the stream, but it's also possible as I just said, for somebody who has had a strong meditative experience to think that they've entered the stream, and if they don't hold to these three fetters and they have the strong trust in the triple gem and good morality, they can be mistaken about their experience. So that's why it's always good 
to try to obtain confirmation from a teacher. But <laughs> maybe one way to check oneself to see whether one is trying to get confirmation from a teacher to build up kudos to one's ego <laughs> so one can think, ah, I'm a stream mentor or I'm a once returner or whether one really just simply wants to get clarification about one's experience. Okay, question four. Did the Buddha say that a stream enterer should never declare to other people that they are stream enterers? To my knowledge, this was never said by the Buddha. What is said is that a monastic person, one of the strong rules is that the monastic person is not supposed to declare to not ordained people that they've reached a particular level of realization. And if they do so falsely, it's a very serious offense. If they do so through a misunderstanding of their attainment, it's still an offense, but not as, as grave. Okay, last question. Why is it controversial about whether jhana is a prerequisite or not to enter the stream? Did the Buddha not specify the level of samadhi required? Okay, this is the something of a controversy amongst some interpreters of early Buddhism. Some say it's absolutely necessary to gain jhana in order to become a stream mentor. Um, I know a couple of contemporary Western monks who have this position, and actually it was their position that motivated me some years ago when I was still in Sri Lanka to investigate the scriptures to see whether they normally describe the stream enterer as one who possesses the jhana. And I found that the normal description of the stream enterer doesn't mention the attainment of the jhanas. And the place where the jhanas are typically mentioned is in connection with the stage of non-returning, not the stage of stream entry. And did the Buddha not specify the level of samadhi required? Now, as I said, the standard definition of right samadhi, sama samadhi, is the four jhanas. But still, I get the impression from certain texts that there is a lower level of samadhi which is sufficient to serve as a basis for developing the, wi the wisdom that will bring stream entry. Okay, so this takes us through all of the questions. Now, I want to move on to the next stage. Here we come to non-returning. Anything missing? Yeah, maybe somebody thinks, well, in putting this book together, Fante omitted a section on the once returner. <laughs> maybe I should have had one, at least one passage on the once returner. But the reason why I didn't put anything on the once returner, because there's nothing said which indicates a very decisive difference in the practices and acquisitions between the stream enterer and the once returner. Pretty much all that is said, the stream enterer eliminates the three lower fetters, and then he becomes, through that, he becomes the stream enterer. The once returner, we have that standard definition. Yeah, this is on page 386, paragraph 44. Here he's speaking in terms of monks, but it's any person, monk, nun, any person. Those who have abandoned three fetters and attenuated, that means they've weakened lust, hate, and delusion, are once returners, returning once to this world to make an end of suffering. And beyond that, almost nothing more is said in the text about the once returner. And so the once returner just goes a little bit beyond the stream enterer in weakening the three bad roots 
of lust, hate, and delusion to the point where they will not come back again to this world. More than one more time, I'm sorry, more than one more time. And so the next really decisive stage where some differences become conspicuous is the stage of non-return. Okay, and so now we take this first passage. Now we're on page 396. This is called Abandoning the Five Lower Fetters. And here the Buddha is speaking to Ananda, and he says there is a path and way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters that anyone without relying on that path and way might know or see or abandon the five lower fetters. This is not possible. Then the Buddha uses the simile of a tree. <coughs> A tree, a large tree, possessed of solid hardwood, and it's not possible for anyone to cut out and remove the hardwood without cutting through its bark and the sapwood. And similarly, the positive side of the simile. If anybody wants to get the hardwood, then they have to cut through the bark and sapwood in order to reach the hardwood. Okay, let's jump down to paragraph 9. Okay, what is the path and way to the abandoning of the five lower centers? Okay, then we come to the first jhana. Okay, first with seclusion from acquisitions or from possessions, with the abandoning of unwholesome states, with the complete tranquilization of bodily inertia, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters and dwells in the first jhana which is accompanied by thought and examination with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. Okay, so this mentions now the first jhana. Okay, now based on that jhana, one develops insight. This will be insight into the five aggregates included within the experience of jhana, examining the five aggregates, in terms of the three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. But these are now expanded into 11 qualities, or 11 angles, you can say. So whatever exists there within that dynamic experience of form, feeling, perception, volitional factors, and consciousness, he sees those dhammas, those states, as impermanent, as suffering, now some new things, as a disease, as a tumor, as a barb or dart, as a calamity, as an affliction. Those are just elaborations of which of the three characteristics. Okay? Right. They're just different ways of highlighting the characteristics of suffering. Okay. As an affliction, as alien, as disintegrating, as empty, as non-self. Okay. These are highlighting which characteristic? Speak up. Only non-self? Yeah, the disintegrating is highlighting impermanence and alien or thought as literally means as other, as different. 
as alien, as empty, as non-self, are three ways of highlighting the selfless nature of these aggregates. Okay, so he sees these five aggregates through these eleven angles, from these eleven angles. Then he turns his mind away from those states and directs it towards the deathless elements. And then this is the way he experiences the deathless element. This is peaceful, this is sublime. That is the stilling of all conditioned formations, all sankharas. The relinquishing of all acquisition, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. And so what is happening here, the way I understand it, as one gets the deeper insight into the five aggregates by way of these eleven angles, at a certain point the mind turns away from all these conditioned phenomena and just focuses upon Nibbana, which comes into the field of awareness. And so if one is steady in that, if one is firm in that, then one attains the destruction of the asavas, the defilement. Right on the spot, one will achieve complete arhatsa or one will completely achieve our hardship. But if he does not attain the destruction of the pain, if the power of the, if the mind is not powerful enough, if the insight is not deep enough, then through that very desire for the Dhamma, that the light in the Dhamma, then one will destroy the five lower fetters and become one who will be reborn spontaneously, not anymore in this world, but in the higher realm, and there attain final nibbana without ever returning from that world. So the Buddha says, this is the path and way to the abandoning of the five lower fetters. Okay, then basically the same thing is repeated with each of the other attainments, the second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, each one, one contemplates all of the five aggregates in terms of these eleven qualities. Okay, then one could also use the three lower foremost attainments as a base for achieving the state of non-return. Here, with the complete transcending of perception of forms, with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, one enters and dwells in the base of the infinity of space. Whatever exists there of feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, notice something is missing here but not a typographical mistake. Form. Right, form. This is because in the formless experience, there is no form which is serving as the object. And so when one investigates the experience of the formless meditation, all one has to examine are the four mental factors, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. So one sees these formless states as impermanent, suffering, disease, and so on, through to non-self. Again, one turns the mind away from them and directs it towards the deathless element. So this is stated for the base of infinite space, for the base of the infinity of consciousness, and finally for the base of the infinite. Yeah. Finally, transcending the base of the infinity of, of consciousness, aware that there is nothing, no obstruction, one enters and dwells in what is called the base of nothingness. Maybe that's better translated, the base of non-obstruction. 
but there's still things there, <laughs> whatever exists there of feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One can't say that there's nothing, <laughs> absolutely nothing there. But it's because in that formless meditation one gets the sense that there's no impediment, no obstruction in that infinity of consciousness. And so one gets the sense that there's nothing here, nothing obstructive. Okay, and so the same thing is explained, the same process, investigating those aggregates in terms of the eleven from the eleven angles, turning the mind away from them, directing it towards the deathless element, and then one either cuts off all of the defilements and becomes an arhant through the destruction of the asavas. Or, if one doesn't succeed in that, one becomes a non-returner. Okay, so we can see here that what is mentioned as, we say, the two main components in the process of attaining the stage of non-returner. One is to achieve some level of deep meditative absorption. And the lowest stage, as mentioned, is the first jhana. And then one investigates that experience, that jhanic experience, in terms of the three characteristics expanded into eleven headings. So that is the side of insight. So we have the two sides, the two aspects, of serenity through the jhana and insight through investigation of the three characteristics or the eleven aspects. Okay, one question that might come up. We know that there are four formless meditations. So why is the fourth formless meditation not mentioned? This is called the base of neither perception nor non-perception. And the reason that's given is that the fourth formless meditation is said to be too subtle to be used as an object of investigation. The mental factors in that attainment become so fine, so reduced, that one can't see them clearly enough to gain insight knowledge based upon them. Okay, now, uh, from this passage here, it seems that the jhanas are absolute requisites for the attainment of the stage of non-returning. But there's another passage which <laughs> suggests that there might be some qualification to that. And that comes, this is a passage which is called Four Kinds of Persons. So here the Buddha says, there are among four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What are the four? Okay, first, there is somebody who, in this very life, attains Nibbana through volition, volitional exertion, that is, with some effort, some exertion, strong exertion. Then there's a person who, with the breakup of the body, attains final Nibbana through volitional exertion. Then there is a person who in this very life attains final Nibbana without volitional exertion. And then a person who with the breakup of the body attains final Nibbana without volitional exertion. So the first two persons are those who attain Either they attain Nibbana in this very life through volitional exertion. That means they become an Arhat in this life. 
but they have to make a strong exertion to attain it. The second will be somebody who doesn't become an arhat in this life, but in the next life or after death. And this person attains through volitional exertion. The third is the person who achieves arhatship without volitional exertion, without some strenuous exertion. And the fourth is the person who achieves who doesn't achieve arhatship in this life, but in the future life, but is able to achieve it without the strong volitional exertion. So now let's see exactly the way they're defined. Okay, how does a person in this very life attain Nibbana through volitional exertion? Okay, now pay careful attention to this. Here a monk dwells contemplating the unattractiveness of the body, perceiving repulsiveness in food, perceiving discontent with the entire world, this is a type of meditation subject which emphasizes contemplating, reflecting upon the disadvantages in life in the world, then contemplating impermanence in all conditioned phenomena, and then he has the perception of death well established within him. Notice that these are meditation subjects which emphasize we would say the the adinava, the unsatisfactory nature of worldly life, the drawbacks, disadvantages, and dangers in the world. One contemplates the body is full of these impurities. One contemplates food, the process of like, chewing the food, swallowing, digestion. Um, assimilation, elimination of food. One perceives or reflects on all of the dangers that one can meet by living in the world. One contemplates how everything that comes into being is impermanent. And one reflects again and again on the inevitability of death. Okay, so these are meditation subjects which don't emphasize that kind of inner tranquility, inner stillness, which leads into the jhanas, but instead brings a kind of disenchantment with the world and develops this passion. Then he relies on the five powers of the training. He has faith, moral shame, fear of wrongdoing, energy and wisdom, and the five faculties are strong in him. These are the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And because of the strength of these five faculties, in this very life, he attains Nibbana, that is, he achieves Arhatship. Through volitional exertion, and when we contrast what is meant by volitional exertion to what is the practice without volitional exertion, we see that why volitional exertion is mentioned here is because this practitioner uses these meditation subjects that are somewhat disagreeable, that will lead to a sense of disenchantment and dispassion. Okay, so this is how a person achieves Nibbana in this very life through volitional exertion. So that is the one who achieves arhatship based on these, we could call these repugnant meditation subjects. Okay, then how is a person one who achieves Nibbana with the breakup of the body, that is in the next life? through volitional exertion. Here, this person uses the same meditation subject. He relies on the five powers of the training, but the five 
faculties are relatively weak in him. That is, the faculties of faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And because the five faculties are relatively weak, he's not able to go all the way through to our hardship, to reach Nibbana in this very life, but instead, he has to reach Nibbana with the breakup of the body. That is, he becomes a non-returner. Okay, then we come to the third type of person. This is one who, in this very life, attains Nibbana without volitional exertion. And now let's see what is meant by being without volitional exertion. Here, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, the monk enters and dwells in the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. He relies on the same five powers of the training, and he has the five faculties strong within him, the faculties of faith, and so on, through wisdom. And because of the strength of the five faculties in this very life, he achieves arhatship. He attains nibbana without volitional exertion. Then the next case, the one who with the breakup of the body, who attains nibbana with the breakup of the body without volitional exertion. Here we have somebody who achieves the four jhanas. He has the five powers of the training and the five faculties are relatively weak in him, and because those five faculties are weak, he attains Nibbana, not in this life, but in the next life, without volitional exertion. And so here we have two types of persons, let us say, to which we put together these two attainments, either our object, or non-returning. So we can see if we put box both our hot shift and non-returning together, we can see that there are two paths mentioned, or two approaches to both of these attainments, the path which is said to be with exertion, this is the more strenuous path, it's a more difficult path, it takes more maybe willpower in order to to compel oneself to engage with the practice, because this particular path uses approaches to meditation that highlight the disagreeable nature of worldly existence. So by dwelling on these themes like the impure nature of the body, the dangers of worldly life, the inevitability of death, they're meditation subjects which don't naturally calm the mind down and keep it focused on one point, but they create and generate a strong sense of sangveda, that means a sense of urgency, a sense of compelling need to gain liberation and freedom. And this path is contrasted with what is called the path without insertion, which doesn't mean that one doesn't have to use effort to get it, that you just sit down in the comfort of your chair and then you enter the four jhanas. <laughs> of course, to gain the four jhanas, you have to make a very strong effort. But I think why this, the reason this path is called the one without insertion is because it's an intrinsically pleasant path. One experiences states of bliss and rapture and tranquility, and the mind can become deeply, very deeply serene.
And then this path is explained as the four jhanas, the path of the four jhanas. And both paths will lead to the stage either nibbana in the very life, that is our hardship, or nibbana with the breakup of the body. That will be the stage of non-returning, that is one achieves it in the next life. And what distinguishes practitioners between attaining our hardship or non-returning is the relative strength of the five spiritual faculties. So those who have strong faculties can gain our hardship. Those with relatively weak faculties gain non-returning. Now this sutra does not say that it's possible to achieve our hardship and non-returning without the jhana. It doesn't say that explicitly. But to my mind, in drawing this contrast between these two approaches, it seems to be suggesting that there is one approach which emphasizes the jhanas and makes them the pillar of the practice. And there's another approach which it's unclear whether or not the jhanas enter into that approach. But their significance in that approach is not very prominent. What is more prominent is the development of meditation subjects which turn the mind away from the world towards disenchantment, dispassion, and liberation. Okay, maybe at this point I will pause and then ask for questions. One person that came out and said there's no more work to do to become Buddha. If you will. If a person to become an architect, yeah. is that person considered a Buddha or something that you should have to work with? I am confused in terms of that land and the terminology. Okay, I think I will come to that question in a later class, but I'll just be very, very briefly now. You see, the Buddha <coughs> and what we call the Arhat are alike in being Arhat. The Buddha is also Arhat. So Arhat means somebody who has eradicated all defilements and becomes liberated from the realms of birth and death. And now in the early teaching, there's no essential difference between the Buddha and the Arhat in that respect. The difference is that the Buddha is one who discovers the path at a time when it's not known, and he understands the path and the Dhamma in a very comprehensive way, and teaches in a very comprehensive way. Whereas those who listen to the Buddha's teaching and practice under his guidance, and then gain liberation, become arahas. But then later in Mahayana Buddhism, <coughs> this difference between the Buddha and the arahas became emphasized more and more, until the Buddha became elevated to a much, much higher level. And then, <laughs> at least in some senses, the idea appears that the Arhat shift is a kind of half, <coughs> half, <coughs> halfway house to full Buddhahood. <laughs> and then one has to go on practicing further to become the fully enlightened Buddha. <laughs> but that's not found in your early teaching. Uh, put, put the microphone. I, I know that the, it's on page 397, but I'm not clear about the 11 and the 15 and the 5 actually. I think there's 11. <coughs> Let me just do a quick count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Okay, the 11 uh, uh, starting with impermanence. Okay, so let's take first the characteristic of impermanence that is indicated by two of the 11, impermanence and disintegrating. 
then to make it easy, we take the characteristic of non-selfness that is indicated by, I believe it's three, <coughs> by alien, <coughs> alien, alien, empty, and non-self. And then all of the rest, suffering, disease, tumor, barb, calamity, affliction, those are the characteristic of suffering. Okay, next question. The conversation of dependence on the community that when we have this free anger and it is to it is to the kind it is to the conversation of the conversation in the other aspect that when Tantra is not returning. I would <coughs> what I would say <coughs> is that the penetration of dependent origination is quite characteristic of the attainment of the stream enterer. But I don't see how one could become a stream enterer without also contemplating the three characteristics. But it says in the text that the knowledge of dependent origination marks one as a stream enterer. So one who has a clear understanding of dependent origination in terms of the factors each one's arising, cessation, the path to the cessation, is a stream enterer. But it's not enough just to contemplate dependent origination, one also has to contemplate the three, generally one has to contemplate the three characteristics to become a stream enterer. Um, now to reach arhatship, sometimes it's so shown simply through the three characteristics. Um, but this division into eleven headings, we find this in a few sutras, but many sutras will sometimes just mention the three character, character the three characteristics together. Sometimes they will mention even just one of the three characteristics. So it seems if one contemplates one, understanding of the others will come as well. What is the difference between five powers and five things? You see, there's two terms, there's two groups of five powers. The normal group of five powers are actually the five, same five mental states as the five faculties. But the two terms seem, seem to indicate a difference in function between them. The word faculty suggests something which exercises a dominant or controlling function. So, you speak about the faculty of faith, so this gives a more dynamic emphasis. It shows that factor of faith in its, in its dynamic role as a factor that takes the leading role in overcoming skepticism and disbelief. Or concentration, the faculty of concentration, shows that mental factor of concentration as it exercises a dominant role in overcoming mental distraction. Whereas the five powers indicate these same five mental states in, insofar as they cannot be shaken or displaced by their opposites. Perhaps the five powers are the five states when they've acquired greater strength, the greater power. Okay. Further questions? Can you just ask a technical question? Yeah. Um, in the text of the last week I was referring to, uh, it talked about the mind that turned away from these states. Yeah. What, what does these states refer to? It means the five aggregates. Yeah. The form, feeling, perception, volitions, and consciousness. Not the characteristics that you left in the I don't think so. It's a state like I guess be the factors themselves. 
which uh, the term was the breakup of the body. That's just when you see that as means no return. Well, what it indicates is that it means that it's not in this life itself, but it has to be in the future life. Okay, I'm going to take the questions that came over the internet. Is taint the equivalent of unwholesome mental state? Not in general, the taints are three specific unwholesome mental states. We speak about the three octaves. Those are the three taints of craving for sensual pleasures, craving for continued existence and ignorance. Does the destruction of taints occur accompanied by intention or does it happen naturally without intention? There has to be some intention to reach the destruction of taints, but it doesn't mean that it takes place according to one's intention. One has to write in all of the factors necessary for that to take place, and then it will occur. Third question is insight only practice after one emerges from jhana and makes use of the experience of jhana to observe impermanent suffering and non-self. There are different approaches to meditation for answering this question. I recommend in the chapter of Mastering the Mind, the section on four ways to arhatship, page 268, and four kinds of persons, page 269. Okay, in this usual formula for the enlightenment process, this Disenchantment, dispassion, and liberation. What is the difference between disenchantment and dispassion? What I would say is disenchantment is a stage of deep insight where one has seen into the impermanence, suffering, and selflessness of phenomena, and one is now turning away from all conditioned phenomena. Then dispassion, according to the commentaries, indicates the stage where one makes the breakthrough to the world-transcending path and is actually in the process of eradicating defilement. And then that is followed by the stage of liberation when one is actually free from the defilement. Then where do liberation of mind and liberation by wisdom come into the scheme? I'm going to discuss these when we come to the Arhat. That will be in the next class. And then I have to make an announcement about when the next class will take place. Last, I think earlier I said that we'll have, we won't have the class next weekend. It's the Labor Day weekend. I originally said that the next class will be the Saturday after that, September 12th. So I wasn't aware then that there will be an eight day ceremony taking place here. This is the Bian Wang Parkway. Yeah, and so we can't have the class that Saturday either, September 12th. So the next class will be September 19th. So there will be actually two more classes in this whole series, September 19th, September 26th. Then this series comes to an end. But I will start another series after that. <laughs> Maybe we take some sutras from Mati Manikaya. Would you like to do that? Who is arranging? <laughs> well, I think we have to tell them that. Um, but does that mean I have to go for them? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I'm going to. Well, I'll speak to. Okay, I'll speak to them about that. Anyway. 
for now we could schedule it for September 26th. <laughs> okay, let us end by the sharing of, with the sharing of the merits. Then we have a lunch break, and then for those who want to discuss them, come back after lunch.